The Morgan Report with David Morgan. David Morgan, themorganreport.com, 18 September 2020. Well, let me start off the stock market as I usually do. And let's just say, I think last week or week before, I said, this is it. It's the top, I'm pretty sure. And that was basis, the fact that what's been leading the market has been the the tech stocks, the FANG stocks, the Facebooks, the <clears throat> Netflix, the Googles. And they were breaking down Tesla. And I said, I think that's it. And so far, it looks like I'm correct. The NASDAQ 100 breaks its short-term support, the 50-day moving average. And also the S&P 500 is turning down. That's about all I want to say other than an interview I did recently where I reasserted what uh, many know already, and that's that the uh, dollar, gold doesn't move opposite the dollar, really. It does a lot of the time, but it really, gold moves opposite the stock market. So stock market down, gold up. Does that mean on a day-to-day, one-to-one correspondence? And the answer is no. I've been getting a lot of questions about, well, which way is it going to break? And I'm going to do that for our premium or paid subscribers later today and send it out to the membership. <clears throat> There is a way to do it that's not 100% accurate, but it's uh, fairly infallible, high probability, depending on the market itself. And I will be going over that again for our membership. So moving on, I'd just like to uh, point out that we're sponsoring the Silver Watch List. And you can probably Google that, find it. Once uh, it's totally set up, I will post it somewhere probably on the landing page so people can see it. It's length of about 20 stocks or so, majors uh, and juniors and some mid-tiers. It's kind of a good mix, uh, primarily silver companies. There are not that many pure, and there's no such thing really as a pure silver company, but companies that make at least 50% of their revenue goes to the bottom line via silver and not silver equivalent. And that's what we strive to put in there. There are a few exceptions, but we do the best we can. From CNBC, OECD, Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development, projects global GDP will collapse by 4.5% this year. And I think that may be not uh, optimistic. It may be worse than that. Time will tell. Very quick read. The headline basically tells you everything. Article was looking at maybe doing a little study on it from Bloomberg. Dethroned dollar is making waves across markets in five charts. I'm not going to go over them except briefly. It talks about stocks, bonds, emerging markets, gold, and I probably missed one, but it's a good article and uh, paying attention to these charts. Uh, the euro's in here too, and uh, things are changing as we as we know. This is a very quick read, but you've got to think about it a bit and where the uh, depreciation do- depreciating dollar is going to take us all. And back to Wolf Richter, Wolf Street. I really like what this gentleman does. In San Francisco, I was born there. One of these days, maybe I'll get to run into him. Anyway, uh, this asks, who bought the $3.3 trillion piled on the incredibly spiking U.S. national debt since March? He goes through everything. I'm just going to scroll down. This is definitely worth the read, but this ending chart kind of shows it all. You can see an increase. The two biggest increases here are the U.S. investors. Yeah, pack that debt onto the people. And, of course, the Federal Reserve itself, you can look at that. Big increase. Banks bought more. Um, You know, trust funds, government pension funds. You can see all these were up slightly, and foreign holders even increased. So all of them, but you can just eyeball it here and see, you know, where we were back here just a little ways back. This is not flat, but slightly up, slightly up. It's up, but you see that U.S. investors, mm, they might be left holding the bag. And, of course, the Fed itself, the buyer of last resort. Let's move on to energy. Oilprice.com I often use. Oil tanker industry is in an ocean of trouble. There has been more than enough written about the woes of various segments of the oil industry and related industries so far this year. But there's one industry that actually thrived during the worst of the crisis. 
As the world drowned in oil amid slumping demand and excess supply, tanker owners enjoyed a bounce in freight rates as these vessels remained the only storage space for unsellable crude oil. But things have changed. OPEC plus oil production cuts helped bring down global inventories, including the massive amount of oil in floating storage. This brought down freight rates from over 250,000 per day for a very large crude carry to less than 30,000 per day. Enough said, you can read the whole thing, but uh, tenuous times in all sectors. Something that the peak oil people really have taken it on the chin and justified or not. I mean, fracking delayed it a um, few years, I would say. I'm still pretty much an adherent to it. Um, anyway, BP Petroleum says we've already reached peak oil. You can make up your own mind, but please look at uh, both sides, at least try to. BP is saying that the quiet part loud in the 2020 Energy Outlook report, the energy giant published this week, it said that the world may have reached peak oil. Now, reach peak oil when we're in this current situation where everyone's driving, or almost everyone's driving less, supply chains have been disrupted. Uh, you know, the article I just showed you with, you know, store, tankers being used for storage facilities and everything else doesn't mean that, um, you know, oil prices are going to show anything here substantive to the upside. What this is saying is what I just read. So the COVID-19 pandemic has done serious number on the oil industry with demand falling to historic lows amid lockdowns and prices falling into negative territory, which you're all aware of or should be. The report on Tuesday, the International Energy Agency, always referred to as the IEA, said that the oil industry that, quote unquote, the path ahead is treacherous, treacherous, unquote, reducing its forecast for global oil demand in 2020 by 200,000 barrels per day. And on Monday, OPEC lowered its price predictions of demand by 2020 by 400,000 barrels per day. So enough said, oil is still vitally important until we come up with alternatives that are well, they don't have to be as energy dense, although that would be great, but uh, viable alternatives in a massive way. Try to comment about food every week from South China Morning Post. China food security concerns prompt rethink of soybean expansion. China should leave bulk soybean production to the U.S. and Brazil and instead develop specialist, non-genetically modified beans, industry leaders say. Beans meaning soybeans. Soybean imports will continue to play a role in domestic consumption, but limited arable land should be used for strategic crops that maintain food security. China should halt the expansion of soybean farms to leave space for strategic crops, including rice, wheat, and corn, to ensure adequate domestic food supply in light of rising tensions with the United States, industry leaders have said. Certainly, there are rising tensions. The way that reads to me, it sounds like that's the problem with food supply, which it's not. It's locust. It's killing off animals. It's weather. It's a lot of things that have damaged the yields across the planet, really. So the food problem is basically a production issue for this year and maybe continuing if you consider the grand solar minimum ahead. So excuse me, next up. CNBC plug-in hybrids called a wolf in sheep's clothing as study claims emissions are higher than thought. Carbon dioxide emissions from plug-in hybrid vehicles are more than two and a half times greater than official test levels, according to new research claims. Published this week, the analysis conducted by the Transport and Environment and Campaign Group and supported by environmental organization Greenpeace stated that on average, quote-unquote, typical plug-in hybrid electric vehicles emit around 117 grams of CO2 per kilometer. This figure is considerably higher than the 44 grams of CO2 per kilometer the official test results have shown. I'll leave it there for now. I have a few more comments to make, and I'll close out this weekly perspective. So I think there's a little bit of crow eating this weekend, or this as I go into the weekend. Uh, first off, I have mentioned a documentary that's free on YouTube called Planet of the Humans. I've watched it uh, twice. It's 
pretty interesting documentary. It's pretty much um, a slant on the green energy and bringing forth that uh, it's not that good. Well, it's actually quite slanted. A gentleman named Doug, I'll just say his first name from Canada, pointed out there's a rebuttal to it. I don't have the video's name at the top of my head, but I will tell you, it's probably easy to find. Just find uh, Planet of the Humans. Debut, debunked rather, or uh, rebuttal to Planet of the Humans. So the guy that does it does really, really good job. So I'm always learning more. Never said I had um, any uh, special, you know, ability to know everything. Or I and I love learning. So thank you, uh, Doug, for that. There's nothing wrong with making mistakes, uh, defending mistakes. That's where you get in trouble. I'm not defending a mistake. I made one. Carry on. And another one that I want to bring out that is uh, came from the uh, Silver Fest 2020, which I participated in last weekend, which was uh, several hours. I didn't time it. I'm not even sure what it was, but probably eight hours on Saturday and similar on Sunday. I certainly didn't watch it all. I participated in, I think, three things on Saturday and one impromptu on Sunday. But... Going back to what I have been saying on a few of the perspectives and a couple private interviews, that what we saw for a spike in the gold-silver ratio here in March, which was roughly 125, I'll call it, was like the highest ever in uh, recorded history. That may or may not be true, and the reason I bring that up is because James Anderson of SD Bullion was talking and said that we hit the same ratio or nearly the same ratio in the Great Depression. Now, this is from Nick Laird's site, Gold Charts Are Us. And uh, you can see with my cursor here, a little over 100 in the 30s. And then again, um, wherever that was, uh, time-wise, I'll just call 1992, I think it was. And then the present one. So this is what I'm going by. But even if it is the same in the 1930s, uh, the further comment that I made is that that ratio portends, and I asserted this, it's unprovable at this point, uh, a Great Depression or a Greater Depression. And we have the data from the 30s at just over 100, according to this chart. And then we know it followed through. Um, and you see the gold-silver ratio got down to, like, it looks like about 15, according to this chart, in, uh, I guess, about 1965, 6, in that range. Anyway, the point is that we are probably entering a great or greater depression. Doesn't mean the end of the world. And I was asked about this in a consultation this morning. And my take is that it will not be nearly as long in duration. But I do think the civil unrest part of it will probably be greater than it was in the 30s. I think people were a little more morally conscious of each other in the 30s, and we had much more of an agrarian economy. We mean the United States, but the world as well. This time, there's a lot more in the city, and there's a lot of, uh, let's say, intolerance among those that tolerate everyone. And I'm trying to be funny here, but it's not funny. So let me, let me leave that part. So the last thing I want to cover on the metals today, and especially on silver, is a question that's been coming in from uh, both paid and, and free uh, subscribers. And that is, what about premiums? And let me tell you, that I try to make this clear in the um, 10 Rules of Silver Investing when I talked about buy the most silver per dollar that you can or per currency unit that you can. And the reason is, and I didn't explain it that much, but it's because premiums fall off. Basically, over time, the premium disappears. Uh, for example, over the last 30 years, you've seen this happen many times. The Canadian gold maple leaf, when it was issued in the late 70s, had a premium of 15%, far more expensive than the then popular gold Krugerrand that was at about 7% at that time. By 1982, the maple leaf was selling at a discount to its gold value and less than a premium on the um, Krugerrand. So over time, the premiums disappear. So what happens in like the bag market or the silver round or silver bar or silver eagle all fetch approximately spot price. 
So you heard me right. Is that the case right now? No. Dealers are paying dollars over to acquire eagles so they can flip them for several dollars above what they paid for them. And that's a situation that exists, but I'm saying in the longer term, the premiums disappear. And that's been proven again and again and again. One quick example on silver is in the Y2K thing. Uh, bag premiums went just astronomically high. I don't remember the number. I'll throw one out 20, 30%. I mean, there's crazy. And then once Y2K came and went, then bags went to a discount. So bags usually sell about melt spot or less in normal times, we'll call it. And again, in normal times, you see premiums really fall off. I mean, a premium on a certain silver coin minted by a government usually doesn't carry that premium when you go to the sell side. I actually went through this with a... Um, Someone on the free list that asked the question, he'd been stacking for a very long time and said he had never heard of that, didn't know about it, was grateful that I told him. And uh, I'm just letting everyone know that that's the case. You can argue with me, but I've been in this market probably a lot longer than anybody else out there due to my uh, wake up call at 11 years of age. And I'm pushing into the higher digits in my in my life right now. And this week, I'm going to end law is force. Since the law organizes justice, the socialists ask why the law should not also organize labor, education, and religion. Why should not the law be used for these purposes? Because could not the law organize labor, education, and religion without destroying justice? We must remember that the law is force and that, consequently, the proper functions of the law cannot lawfully extend beyond the proper functions of force. When law and force keep a person within the bounds of justice, they impose nothing but a mere negation. They oblige him to abstain from harming others. They violate neither his personality, his liberty, nor his property. They safeguard all of these. They are defensive. They defend equally the rights of all. That's from the law, Frederick Bastier, the classic blueprint for a just society. I'll be back with you next week with another weekly perspective.